Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting live on June 27th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa, Florida. And it's super hot out there today. We just heard the NPR News headlines mention that there is a heat dome and record heat and a heat advisory stretching from Arizona all the way to the Florida panhandle. So we're going to talk about that and how there's record heat in the North Atlantic Ocean. There have already been three named storms this spring and early summer, and we'll talk also about what we might expect in the future. And I'd like to hear from our listeners as well. If you can email us you can at dj at wmnf.org or text at 813-433-0885. And I have two guests this hour to talk about what's happening out there, about the climate and what we might expect in the future. And so I want to welcome them right now. Jennifer Francis is senior scientist at Woodwell Climate Research Center in Massachusetts. Her research is on the rapidly changing Arctic and how changes there affect the rest of the globe. Welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Jennifer. Thank you very much, Sean. Great to be here. I'm really glad you could join us. And my other guest is a familiar voice to the people of Central West Central Florida, Jeff Berardelli, Chief Meteorologist and Climate Specialist at WFLA-TV Channel 8. Welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Jeff. Hey, Sean, glad to be here. And hey, Jen, nice to hear your voice. Nice to hear yours too, Jeff. Great to be here with you. Yeah, I'm so glad the two of us could, two of you could come on the show today to join us. Thanks so much for jo joining Tuesday Cafe. So Jeff, let's begin with you and we'll start with the news we just heard from NPR and the climate conditions here in Florida and in the Tampa Bay area before we take a look at the global picture. The National Weather Service Tampa Bay tweeted last night that a warming trend is expected later this week as high pressure builds into the region. Rain chances will be more limited than last week with the highest chances across the interior and southwest Florida and they are forecasting 97 degrees as the high for Friday in West Central Florida. So what is going on with the heat here in Florida? Well, yeah, I mean, this is abnormal for us. I mean, you may think, well, it's Florida, it's summer, you know, it should be 97, but actually we rarely ever get that high, especially in Tampa, because we're so close to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, however, this week we are likely to get there. We're going to be on the edge of the of this big heat dome that's been on top of Mexico and Texas, and that is building north and east. And we're going to be right on the edge of it, so we're not going to be under it, but it's still going to be enough to power us to 97, which means our feels like temperatures are going to probably be near 110 degrees uh, at times during the middle of the day. That is pretty dangerous uh, for us. And uh, typically when we have a heat dome, which kind of centers closer to us, we see less rain chances. So we don't get that cooling effect during the day. So it'll be, you know, a little hotter than it typically would be around here. And we don't need it to be any hotter than it already is. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit more about that heat dome. It was centered for days and days over Mexico and Texas. And then how does how does it get trapped there? And what does the shape of the jet, jet stream look like compared to normal? Right. So, you know, I can do a little bit of uh, uh, talking about this, but then this, of course, is Jennifer's specialty, too. So I'll just say that, you know, the jet stream that I have seen over the past few weeks has been extraordinary to me. Um, it just is really, really amplified, wavy. Uh, and um, and because of it, we we've, we've had this upper level low that's been stuck in the eastern U.S. and this big upper level high or a heat dome ridge that's been stuck across Mexico. Whenever we have these blocky patterns, and that's what this is, we have pressure systems that are not moving. The jet stream is like a snake, and uh, and things get set in stone for for weeks on end. And so that's what happened in Mexico. So Mexico's heat wave probably the worst they they've seen in modern history. Um, I've talked to various uh, experts on this about it, and and it's not just because of the intensity; it's because of the duration. So that's that's why the jet stream becomes important. And I'll defer to Jennifer now because Jennifer has done a lot of research on this. Yeah, let's bring Jennifer Francis, senior scientist at Woodell, Woodwell Climate Research Center in Massachusetts, in to talk about this. Yeah, well, Jeff nailed it on the head uh, talking about. Well, what's been going on lately, Mexico has just been really suffering with this. Um, and they've had uh, quite a bit of, of heat and dryness over the last couple of years. So this is really affecting their agriculture. 
um, really taking a heavy toll. They don't have some of the safety nets that um, that we enjoy in the U.S. Uh, for our farmers. But you know, if you look at the big picture here, we we uh, Jeff mentioned the big heat dome. We've also got these upper level uh, lows that have been parked over uh, the northwest of the United States and also the eastern states. Um, and this is all part of a of a big picture. You step back. Um, and look at what the jet stream pattern looks like. Jeff mentioned that it's been extremely wavy. And when we have these really big waves in the jet stream, they tend not to move much. They really like to get stuck in one place for a long time. So whatever weather you've got, you're probably going to be stuck with it for a while. And as I look at what the jet stream looks like right now, it's it's really unusual for this time of year. We've actually got two branches of the jet stream coming from the Pacific Ocean. Um, one of them is coming from basically Hawaii into Southern California, and the other one is is farther north. And the two are meeting right over Southern California and helping to really pump up this big ridge that's in the middle of the country right now. And that is you know, really responsible for making it so unusually strong and persistent. So the jet stream basically creates all the weather that we experience for the most part in the United States, except for tropical storms. Um, and it, it it steers our weather. So the jet stream is really responsible for all the high pressure areas and low pressure areas that Jeff shows on his weather maps every day. And, you know, so we've been really focusing on how the jet stream has been changing over time, and we're seeing these very wavy patterns happening more often. And that is leading to these very persistent weather conditions that seem to be also happening more often. If the the shape of the jet stream is, is changing, if it's becoming wavier more often, can you attribute that to anything? Yeah, there's a lot of factors in play right now. Um, and you know, as we continue to affect the climate system by continuing to emit greenhouse gases, heat trapping gases into the air, um, we continue to cut down forests, we're warming the globe. This, there's many factors that are coming into play that affect the jet stream. One of them that I have been studying for the last decade or so is how the rapidly warming Arctic um, may be playing a role here. We know now that the Arctic is warming three to four times faster than the globe as a whole. The reason this is important, and people you know, may think of the Arctic as being so far away and really not having in any impact on their lives, but it does because the difference in temperature between the Arctic, which is of course very cold, and areas south of there, is what drives the jet stream. That is the main factor, that temperature difference. And the bigger the temperature difference, the stronger the winds of the jet stream. And when the jet stream, when the jet stream is strong, it tends to blow more straight. So the waves are not that big. So as we're warming the Arctic so much faster, it's making that north-south temperature difference smaller, which is making the winds of the jet stream weaker. We know when the jet stream winds are weak, they tend to meander more, they tend to take these bigger north-south swings, and we tend to see these bigger, uh, wavier patterns happening. Uh, but there are other factors in play too. We've got oceanic heat waves in various parts of the world now. We've had one very persistent in the North Pacific. Right now it's between Hawaii and Alaska. I think that has played a big role in uh, creating the shape of the jet stream, especially this past winter, which has kind of overwhelmed the La Nina typical pattern that we would see. And it was, I think, played a big role in causing the big snowstorms and very stormy conditions that uh, the Western states had. And there are oceanic heat waves, as you mentioned in the beginning, Sean, also over in the northeastern part of the Atlantic Ocean, so off of Ireland and Spain, they're seeing ocean temperatures running uh, 10 degrees above normal, which is crazy for the ocean. So there are many factors in play. It's really hard to say at any one time which factor is the most important one. But what we do know is there's a lot of change, there's a lot of heat, and this is not good. Our guests are Jennifer Francis, senior scientist at Woodwell Climate Research Center in Massachusetts, 
and Jeff Berardelli, Chief Meteorologist and Climate Specialist at WFLA-TV here in Tampa Bay. And we're talking about climate change and the temperature ex extremes that we're experiencing right now. I'm Sean Canan. This is Tuesday Cafe. We're coming to you from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And Jennifer, you were just talking a moment ago about the high temperatures in the in the oceans, and we're certainly going to get to that in during the rest of the uh, program. But I want to ask you um, maybe to have you just uh, double down on one of the things that you mentioned. It sounded like what you were saying is if you are in Texas right now or in North Florida and you're concerned about the heat, that one of the main factors that's driving this is that the Arctic is warming. It seems like something so far away might not be impacting you down here, but that's it's really kind of one of the driving factors. Well, that's uh, a lot of people are researching this very interesting topic. Um, ever since we, we really started looking at it about uh, 12 years ago, we published a paper that suggested that the rapidly warming Arctic was going to create these wavier jet stream patterns. And it's a it's a complicated topic. Um, the jet stream is a very chaotic beast. It's a very complicated part of our of our climate system. And so really pinning down how the Arctic or any other factor is affecting it is uh, is not straightforward at all. But there is evidence that the art that the jet stream has become wavier, especially in the winter months. Um, but uh, there are all these other factors happening as well. Um, one of the things that's happening um, in the springtime that we think is having a direct impact on summer patterns like the one we're experiencing right now is the fact that the snow on the higher latitude land area, so this would be in northern Canada and northern Eurasia, that snow cover is disappearing much earlier in the spring than it used to. And this is really key because as that snow disappears earlier, of course, the sun is very strong in the spring months. So it is now uh, reaching the soil much earlier, drying it out much earlier. And once the soil gets dry, it warms up really fast. So it's in a way, it's jump starting uh, the summer months and creating uh, some of this heat and drought that we saw this year in spades up in northern Canada, which led to those extreme uh, wildfires, which are still going on. So this is a key factor. And there's been some really interesting research out of um, Penn State and Potsdam University in Germany, suggesting that this, this quicker disappearance of the snow is helping to cause the jet stream to split when it comes across the ocean and hits North America, for example, it splits into two branches, one that goes up north along the coast of the Arctic Ocean, and the other one that goes through the middle of the country. And when we see these split jet stream patterns, uh, it tends to trap uh, at, uh, atmospheric masses, air masses between them, and everything just gets stuck in place. And so, you know, there's a lot of moving parts in this research, but this is a really fascinating one that's particularly relevant for the summer months like we're seeing right now. I want to remind people that our guests are Jennifer Francis, Senior Scientist at Woodwell Climate Research Center, and Jeff Berardelli, WFLA-TV Chief Meteorologist and Climate Specialist. And you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And uh, I'm I'm reading things like um, on Twitter, Leon Simons points out that all monthly records are being broken simultaneously. He's talking about June air temperatures, global sea surface temperatures, both are record highs, and global sea ice is a record at a record low. If I could bring Jeff back in, um, what do we know about the the frequency and the the number of record temperatures that are being broken right now and in the last few years? Well, what Leon is talking about is something that's going on that's crazy right now. And I know Jennifer would concur with this. First of all, ocean temperatures are at, at record levels and global oceans are, you know, from 60 north uh, all the way down south. But mostly the north, most mostly to the north of the equator uh, are uh, are really, really hot right now. Um, in fact, I mean, even running the numbers, we've had scientists running the numbers on these. And it's, you know, the chances of this happening in a in a in a climate that hasn't been warmed by humans are almost infinitesimally small. It, it just 
simply couldn't happen without uh, climate change. Climate change has warmed the oceans by around two degrees Fahrenheit or so. Um, so Leon is talking about several things. He's talking about what's going on in the North Atlantic Ocean, uh, but that is also happening in the Pacific. Part of that is El Nino. And uh, also he's talking about Antarctic sea ice, which is just not recovering the way that it should during this time of year. And it's it, the anomaly there is, is I'd say as shocking or almost as shocking as what's happening in the global oceans right now in terms of temperature. So yeah, I mean, a lot of stuff's happening right now, which I think is alarming a lot of people. I think it is even astonishing to meteorologists and climate scientists, but I don't, I won't say it's surprising. We were expecting the unexpected. Right. We were expecting surprises to happen. And I will say I wrote a really long article for WFLA um, recently, and you can easily look it up about the ocean temperatures. There's a lot of things going on. Right. El Nino warms the tropical Pacific Ocean. Jennifer talked about a heat blob, which is, you know, in between Hawaii and and um, and Alaska. Then there's also the main development region of the Atlantic Ocean, which the reason why it's warm is the trade winds are a little weaker and High pressure across the Atlantic has weakened a little bit and there's less Saharan dust. And so that area, the surface has warmed up a lot. That's at least partially the reason. And then as far as what's going on off Ireland and, and the UK, that is a localized you know, heat wave. It's, it's actually pretty large though. Uh, and like she said, it's, it's off the charts. Um, it's a, like a category four to category five. So, but there are, there's just a lot of things lining up on top of each other. It's not, the point that I'm making is it's not just climate change. And actually, Jennifer, I wanted to pick your brain a little bit about, you know, this injection of water vapor into the stratosphere due to the Hunga Tonga volcano. It does seem like the, the, that the, vol, uh, that the uh, water vapor is still up there and that a lot of people are surmising that at least that's, that's one of the reasons for the warming. I know Leon would ask also about the decrease in sulfur dioxide due to shipping over the past couple of years. So I'll just, what are your thoughts on all this? Yes, well, I think water vapor is um, one of the aspects of climate change that doesn't get anywhere near as much attention as it should. Um, about a year and a half ago, I wrote an article for Scientific American going into some of the impacts of the increased water vapor in the atmosphere. But that was before the big volcano that injected a bunch of water vapor very, very high up into the atmosphere. So um, I think most of that water vapor is still confined mainly to the Southern Hemisphere because that's where the volcano is. It was in Tonga, which is south of the equator. Um, and when you have water vapor very high in the atmosphere like that, um, water vapor is a greenhouse gas like carbon dioxide, like methane. And when it's very high in the atmosphere though, I mean, we usually think of greenhouse gases trapping heat at the surface, but when it's really high in the atmosphere, it actually loses more energy to outer space. And so what we see is a cooling of the stratosphere, which is uh, the layer of the atmosphere above where most of the weather happens. It's up where the ozone is. You've heard of the ozone hole. So having that, water vapor injected up there is is likely to um, make the ozone hole a little worse um, for the next couple of years because when it's very cold up in the stratosphere we tend to see um, less ozone up there so um, i don't think it's going to have a big impact on the surface temperature because it is so high in the atmosphere but that said um, over the last few decades, we've seen the amount of water vapor in the lower atmosphere increasing as well. And that's because, of course, we're warming the air, we're warming the ocean, and there's more evaporation from the ocean and from land into the air. And as I said, that water vapor is a greenhouse gas, and so it is acting to trap even more heat in the lower atmosphere. So that's one of these positive feedback loops of vicious cycles that we talk about um, occurring in the climate system. Um, and there's a bunch of those. This is a really important one though. And that water vapor not only increases the amount of heat trapped by greenhouse gases in general, but it also is fuel for storms. It's fuel for hurricanes, it's fuel for all kinds of storms. And so it's contributing to the rapid intensification of hurricanes that we're seeing happening more often. 
but it's also it also means that those storms can tap into even more moisture in the atmosphere. So we're seeing a very um, definite uptick in the frequency of heavy precipitation events. And this is directly connected to that increased water vapor, which is directly connected to our human activities that's increasing the, the temperature of the air and the oceans. I want to remind people that my guests are Jennifer Francis, Senior Scientist at Woodall Climate Research, Woodwell Climate Research Center in Massachusetts, and Jeff Berardelli, who is Chief Meteorologist and Climate Specialist at WFLA-TV. And we're talking about climate change and the temperature extremes that we're experiencing right now and some of the other issues in the climate. I'm Sean Canan. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe, broadcasting from WMNF in Tampa. And both of you have mentioned in the last few minutes El Nino and La Nina. So um, maybe you could explain what that is for our listeners and why we're experiencing right what we're experiencing regarding those right now. Sure. I, I guess if you'd like, I'll 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 take this one. Um, right. So for the past three years, we've had La Nina. Now we should say that um, El Nino and La Nina is a natural oscillation that happens in the Pacific Ocean. And it happens on the scale of every couple to every few years or so. We don't typically see three La Ninas in a row. Now, what La Nina is, is a cooling of the central and eastern equatorial Pacific Ocean. Uh, it's a very large body of water, I should say. Um, so it really does have a huge impact on climate around the globe. In fact, it's probably the biggest, if not one of the biggest, natural climate drivers that we have. So when we oscillate between El Nino and La Nina, it has it means big implications. Um, sometime over the past few months, we have been gradually transitioning over to El Nino, meaning that the really warm water, which was centered in the Western Pacific Ocean near the equator, near Indonesia, uh, essentially is sliding over into the Eastern part of the Pacific Ocean and warming that area. So we're seeing a, a very vast warming of the East and Central Pacific Ocean near the equator, especially near the Galapagos Islands. And I should mention that has a huge impact on marine life in the Galapagos Islands because there's not as much uh, nutrients, not as much cool water and nutrients uh, to feed the wildlife and the marine life there. And um, anyway, that's we can talk more about that if you'd like to. I don't want to go too far into that. But basically, when you push all that warm water into the eastern Pacific Ocean, you start to inject that energy into the atmosphere, and it starts to change global weather patterns. So I would imagine at this point, and we're already seeing some impacts on the jet stream, uh, but yes, it has a big impact not only on the jet stream and on you know the regular storms that we see during the year, but also on hurricane season, we we may already be seeing the impacts of that. And what I mean by that is, yes, we've had three named storms already this season, two of them in the main development region over the past week. We've never seen two storms develop that far east in June. Um, but when they got close to the Caribbean, they were shredded by strong winds. Now, uh, I'm with Jennifer on this. Jennifer talked about the subtropical jet stream moving through California, uh, being essentially manipulated by that um, large body of, of warmth over the central Pacific Ocean. My big question is, to what extent is El Nino already impacting the climate system and how much of that wind shear is actually already being driven by El Nino? We expect as El Nino strengthens for the wind shear probably to pick up, but it may not be in the exact same location as the wind shear is right now, because I, I am, I am certainly not one hundred percent sure exactly how much of that uh, wind shear can even be attributed at this point to El Nino, given that we have such a wavy and complicated jet stream across the globe right now, and and some of that's not likely at all related to El Nino. And I, I would just add to that, and I agree with everything Jeff just said. Um, we are looking at potentially a very strong El Nino forming over the next several months. Um, a lot of the predicting, the centers who predict um, El Nino's are suggesting this. But I would also say that we've never seen a strong El Nino like this con in conjunction with the massive oceanic heat waves that are in place right now as well. So yes, we've a lot of people have studied uh, El Nino's and the impacts on the weather um, in the past. And um, 
you know, we have a general sense of, of how El Nino's affect weather patterns around the globe. But I would say that because we've never had this combination of factors in place all at the same time with such intense oceanic heat waves that I think, you know, we're in for a lot of surprises, like Jeff said. That's I think sure. we, we really don't have a good handle on how the impacts of this El Nino are going to play out. Um, generally speaking, the impacts are strongest during the winter months, whether it's the Northern Hemisphere winter or the Southern Hemisphere winter. Of course, it's winter in the Southern Hemisphere now. Um, but we do have this uh, impact on the Atlantic hurricane season that Jeff mentioned. But, you know, whether El Nino is going to dominate with the shear or whether the big oceanic heat wave in the eastern North Atlantic is going to be the dominant one, I think all bets are off right now. We might be seeing that over the next few months to figure out what, what the answer is. And I want to remind people that my guests are Jennifer Francis, senior scientist at the Woodwell Climate Research Center, and Jeff Berardelli, WFLA-TV chief meteorologist and climate specialist. And you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. And uh, we actually have somebody on the line who wants to ask a question. So if that's okay with both my guests, let me, let me bring Mark from Lakeland on for a question. Hi, Mark. Hi, hi John. How are you? Um, I just wanted to compliment Jeff on his nightly uh, meteorological 101 uh, sessions. Uh, it's extremely informative, and uh, some of us are paying attention. I, I feel like I should be taking notes uh, because the final exam uh, is coming. And uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's, it's actually in the mail. I sent I sent it to you already. I'm expecting it. I'm expecting an A. Uh, don't disappoint me. Well, MNF has MNF has my email address, but uh, keep up the format, man. You do a great job. I love it. Thank you so much. That's really nice of you to say. It's nice to have that support because I'm doing as much education and teaching and science and climate as I can do, and uh, it's nice to hear feedback from viewers, knowing that you know at least there's some people out there that appreciate it. So thank you. Thank, thanks for that comment, Mark. And, you know, Jeff, on that note, I don't want to take too much time away from our discussion about what's happening and what's happening and what can um, happen, might, what might happen in the future. But I, but that, there's a point there. And there's a, and let me see if I'm, uh, if I'm, I'll ask you if, if I'm being fair about this. There has been kind of a wrap that some meteorologists have just kind of told us what the weather has been and what the weather might be and not really made that connection with anthropogenic climate change um, in the in the past but it sounds like that the good meteorologists the best ones out there are making that connection now um, is, do you have anything to to correct or add to what I just said well I, I'm not going to make a judgment on good and bad <laughs> that I will say but um listen um, we got big problems. Uh, the climate is changing very fast. Nothing like we've ever seen before in modern history or even going back over 100,000 years. Um, and, uh, and it's due to things that we're doing. You know, we're burning a lot of fossil fuels right now. Uh, I'll just say that the good news is we know exactly what the problem is and we know exactly how to fix it. You know, when you get a cancer diagnosis and it's stage whatever, you know, stage four, <laughs> I mean, there's sometimes the doctor says, I'm sorry, there's, there's not much we can do. We, we just, we don't have the tools. We actually have the tools to save ourselves and, uh, and, you know, and life on earth. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we, and we, you know, we, we know the answers and we know exactly how to do it. So I would just say this, that I just find it to be my responsibility to, you know, shed some light on the situation to let everybody know what I'm seeing and how, how things are changing at, you know, in my job as a meteorologist in the years that I've been doing it. Um, and we're trying to shout from the rooftops, but I will say, Sean, that it's a little bit difficult because there are there is a lot of pushback out there. And I think that there are meteorologists out there who feel maybe threatened by the pushback uh, or concerned what their bosses may think or a concern that they may lose some viewers you know, and so they kind of like to stay away from it because it's a safer, it's a safer lane. For me, my moral obligation to inform the viewers is far superior to that. And so I've taken some chances in my career and knock on wood, things have worked out for me and I've been embraced here in the Tampa Bay area. And I hope that people appreciate that. Um, 
it's just I my moral code is I tell the truth. And the truth is, is that we really need to make sure we're doing our best to combat climate change. And one of the things you're talking about is that TV meteorologists and scientists are dealing with trolls and sometimes they get threatening messages when they try to communicate about climate. And there's recent examples of that that have had, um, you know, really scary and, um, you know, career ending results. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't want to steal, uh, I want, you know, I'd like Jennifer to also be able to weigh in too, but I'll just, yes, you're talking specifically about a meteorologist from Des Moines, Iowa. I know Chris, his name is Chris. And he recently ended up quitting because um, there was a lot of pressure and he ended up getting some death threats. And, you know, it's not OK, right? It's not OK to be threatening anyone for just speaking the truth. But it is threatening because it threatens people's ideology. Uh, it's not often the science. But you know what? I, I don't want to go too deep into that. But, yes, that does exist. And I'm sure Jennifer has has some stuff that she can say, too. Yeah, we'd like to hear Jennifer's input on this. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I would just um, also commend Jeff on the incredible job that he's been doing. And I think the role of TV meteorologists cannot be underestimated because they have huge audiences that people like I cannot or yeah, I cannot reach audiences um, as big as TV meteorologists can reach. I mean, they're often the only scientists that people ever encounter in their lives and they come into their living rooms on their TV screens, you know, every evening. And so it's a huge opportunity uh, for them to explain what's going on when we have all this crazy weather, um, when um, their homes are, they see people's homes being destroyed by a hurricane or by a tornado or by sea level rise or, or whatever it is. It's a, it's an incredible opportunity to take that disaster and that people are really interested in and then explain, you know, why we think these things are happening more often and how it's connected to climate change. So I know that up until really just a decade or two ago, there were many TV meteorologists that were very reluctant to go down that road of addressing climate change and connecting it to, to weather and talking about science more generally. Um, I think it's not just the meteorologists themselves, but also the producers on their uh, of their uh, of their TV or radio stations that uh, felt like it was a, a too controversial a topic. But I think that is changing. Um, I think the voices that are pushing back and and threatening these uh, people who, as Jeff said, they're just they're just telling the truth. They're 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 explaining the science. Those voices are relatively few, but they're really loud and they're very disruptive. So um, I think most people actually appreciate learning this information because it is complicated stuff, but it is affecting everyone now. The climate crisis is here. This is not something that we're talking about happening to our kids and, and grandkids only. It's It's already here. And so making it clear to people that this is happening, it's connected to climate change. We are responsible. And as Jeff said, we also have the tools. We can do a lot about it. We can't turn around this big ship completely, but we can make it much better in the future if we take action rapidly and boldly. Um, and it is starting to happen. Um, I am very hopeful that um, especially the next generation is really focused on trying to solve this problem as best they can. I see the, these incredibly smart uh, people coming out of excellent schools that are very motivated to, to put their talents to work on this problem. And so that gives me a lot of hope. Our guests are Jennifer Francis, Senior Scientist at the Woodwell Climate Research Center in Massachusetts, and Jeff Berardelli, WFLA-TV Chief Meteorologist and Climate Specialist you're listening to Tuesday Cafe on WMNF, and I'm Sean Canan. And so, Jennifer, that that maybe is a good time for us to back up a little and talk about what is climate change and how it's caused and what's the human role in climate change. So uh, for people who might be stumbling upon this idea for the first time, why don't we give them a, a, give people a little bit of a just a background about climate change? Sure. Yeah, so, you know, really the fundamental cause of climate change is the fact that we are 
putting these gases into the atmosphere that trap the heat that is emitted by the Earth's surface. So we know that the sun shines down on the Earth, and that is where all of the heat comes from that, uh, that keeps us at a comfortable temperature on Earth. But that um, energy from the sun really passes right through the atmosphere, except for when it hits a cloud. And most of it gets absorbed by the surface of the Earth, which warms it up, of course. And then that heat um, then gets re-emitted by the Earth in longer wavelength energy. And that longer wavelength energy is what gets trapped by what we call greenhouse gases. So it's emitted by the Earth, it's absorbed by these greenhouse gases, and then sent right back down towards the Earth. And this creates a blanket on the Earth. So we would not be able to live on this planet without greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. But what we're doing is we're, we're making that blanket thicker by dumping more carbon dioxide, more methane, and we talked about the water vapor contribution as well. All of those gases are making that blanket thicker. So it's just like putting an extra blanket on your bed. Um, you don't change the, the temperature of your room, but you're gonna be warmer with a thicker blanket. So this is really the underlying foundational um, idea behind climate change. And of course, we know that that extra carbon dioxide and extra methane are coming from human activities primarily, and mostly from burning fossil fuels. Fossil fuels being these dead plants and animals that were um, laid, that died um, many thousands of years ago and got trapped in the earth and uh, eventually became um, oil and uh, methane. Some people call it natural gas. I don't call it natural gas anymore because it's methane. Natural gas sounds like it's fine. It's not fine. It's, a, it's also a fossil fuel. And by burning this carbon that has been buried for thousands of years underground, it's, it, you can think of it as like taking it from outer space and dumping it into the air because it, it has been trapped down there and it should stay down there. Um, but this is where the warming is happening. The other really big uh, thing that we're doing that's uh, making the problem worse is we're cutting down the forests, the large forests around the globe. Trees are the most effective natural climate solution that we have. By cutting down trees, which are mainly carbon, um, we, we are effectively putting that carbon also into the atmosphere, whether it gets burned or whether it just rots or, or whatever turned into wood pellets and burned into stove in your stoves, which is a really bad idea. Uh, but cutting down forest, um, ruining our wetlands, cutting down mangrove swamps, those are all natural ways that the climate salute, the climate system removes carbon from the air. So not only are we dumping more heat trapping gases in the atmosphere, but we're also removing the natural ways that those gases are taken out of the air. So that's kind of a why this is happening 101. Since we're on the subject of climate change and, and people um, pushing back against that whole idea, I want to read a headline and then I read a response from a climate scientist and get both of your reactions. So The Hill recently had this headline, scientists failed for decades to communicate the coming risks of rapid sea level rise to policymakers and the public, a new study has found. And in response, Professor Michael Mann, famous for the hockey stick diagram, tweeted that an alternative proposal is that bad actors have clouded the public discourse and bought off <laughs> politicians. So if, if if both of you don't mind um, kind of responding to uh, what, what was just said. I mean, scientists have been raising the red flag and they've been publishing a lot of papers. Now, scientists aren't necessarily the best communicators. Michael happens to be a great one. Jennifer happens to be a great one, but not all are. But they have tried really, really hard. Uh, and, and, and Michael is exactly right. There's been hundreds of millions, really at this point, billions of dollars spent on deception campaigns by the powers that be that do not want to change because they're making lots of money off the status quo. So uh, I would say this is, I don't even know. I, I, listen, I read that article and I had the same question in my mind. And this was a scientific study that was published and there's a little bit more nuance to it than just blaming scientists. But 
You know, the bottom line is scientists have tried their hardest to get the message out about climate change. And and it's amazing to me that at this point, we still have to explain how climate change happens. But there's a reason for that. There is a very determined and very intentional campaign out there to deceive people. And it's working on a decent percentage of people in the American public. If you go to other countries, there's a lot less of that climate doubt. I agree with everything Jeff said. Um, he nailed nailed it again. Um, and I would just add that, yes, this, this campaign that's incredibly well-funded and incredibly successful um, has really confused a lot of people out there, and especially people who want to believe it because they don't want to change their lifestyles at all. They want to keep driving a huge pickup truck. Um, they want to, uh, you know, use uh, energy in often wasteful ways. Um, they don't want to put in any kind of a conservation um, approaches in their homes or whatever it is, um, making it easy for people to say, I don't want to do that. Um, and like I said, they've been incredibly successful at at casting doubt on uh, and on all the things that scientists have been trying to communicate for literally decades, going back to the early 1980s. And even before that, we've known that this is going to be um, a big problem. And if we had addressed it way back then, um, even at some moderate level, we would not find ourselves in this really crisis situation that we are in now. So, but it's not too late, you know, yesterday was the best time, but today's the next best time. And so we, we just need to get on with it and uh, get over this aspect of the fact that uh, there's some, some very wealthy uh, companies and organizations out there that are trying to confuse everyone, but um, don't buy it, uh, listen to the science and, We've got these tools, as we've talked about, and we need to just double down and start putting them to work, which we already are. So again, there's a lot of hope. Um, and I think people are realizing that they've been fed this um, malarkey for, for years. And here we are in this situation. So um, yeah, I think we're, we're getting on the right track finally. I want to mention one thing. I think we need to be clear about how certain the science is. Mm -hmm. There is absolutely no doubt at all, given all the scientific literature, that climate change is being caused by humans. What percentage? All of it. All of it. Okay. And if you ask climate scientists around the world, the ones that have been studying this, it's greater than 99% agreement among them. But if you actually look at the research itself, and, and Jennifer, I'm going to talk about Ben Santer's um, research he published a couple of years ago, that we have reached the gold standard in scientific proof that climate change is being driven by humans. Now, I don't want to get too deep into this, but but we're talking about, so I, I like to think of things in statistics and sigmas, right? This is something like a, isn't it something like a greater than five, is it something like a six sigma type of um, certainty, Jennifer? And when I, when, I, when I bring that up, it's the greatest certainty you can have in science is in science, basically. Yeah, it's a, as you said, it's, it's, we're absolutely certain that human activities and increasing greenhouse gases are the reason why the climate is changing now. And I would add, you know, sometimes people say, oh, the climate's always changed. Um, this is just, you know, another swing in the climate system. Well, yes, that's true. And we know why the climate system has always changed. There are um, changes in the Earth's orbit. Um, that sometimes it's more round and sometimes it's more elongated. There are changes in the tilt of the Earth. And both of these things have caused the glacial, you know, the ice ages and the, and the interglacial the warm periods going back, you know, thousands and millions of years. We know why the climate changed in the past. And if only those natural climate um, factors were operating right now, we would be in a cooling cycle. The earth would be gradually cooling. But no, we are warming it much faster than at any time, as far back as we can see in the climate record. 
And we know why it's happening. And as Jeff said, it's like, there's absolutely no doubt why it's happening. So I think that's useful for people to understand. Sometimes when I give talks and, and tell people that, you know, we should be cooling now, but look what's happening instead. They're like, oh, wow. <laughs> so um, yeah, just wanted to throw that one in. Our guests are Jennifer Francis, Senior Scientist at the Woodwell Climate Research Center, and Jeff Berardelli, WFLA-TV Chief Meteorologist and Climate Specialist. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF Tampa. And we began the show by talking about heat and uh, the, the huge heat waves that are happening in the southern U.S. and other places around the globe. But besides heat, why should people in Florida care about long-term impacts of a warming climate? Jeff? Lots of reasons. Um, one of those, obviously, is hurricanes, right? We are seeing a greater proportion of the strongest hurricane or, or of hurricanes become strongest hurricanes. So essentially, Cat 4s and Cat 5s especially. So that's just one reason. Uh, but that's not the only reason. Also, warming waters mean more algae blooms. And that's a big problem. I mean, you know, if you have been a boater in Florida, uh, if you spend time on the water, and I have, I used to have a boat when I lived in Tampa 20 years ago, and I spent a lot of time, the waterways aren't as healthy as they used to be. I mean, the algae is really starting to take its toll. Think about times when we have red tide outbreaks or blue-green algae outbreaks for months at a time, what that does to businesses. So this is, takes an economic toll. And what about sea level rise, right? A warming ocean means that it expands and also warming ocean means, and warming air means that we're melting more ice off of Greenland and Antarctica. And so our sea levels are rising. So that affects property values, right? I mean, think about what's happening in Florida right now. I would say the number one reason why people need to pay attention to climate change is insurance. It is very hard to get it's impossible to get inexpensive homeowners insurance in Florida now. People's policies are going up by 50 to 100% a year now. Now, I don't know if that's going to be for a while or if that's just a correction, but we're already feeling this economically. People that used to be able to afford living here in Florida, they can't afford to live here anymore because they're on a fixed income. There are a lot of people on fixed incomes. So I would say that the number one, there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of reasons we should care. But in Florida, it is already hitting us economically in the pocketbook, and this is just the very beginning. Jennifer, I would just you're not add to that. Um, you know, there's also we we saw that huge flooding event in the Fort Lauderdale area a couple months ago. Get, that's getting back to this uh, increased frequency of heavy precipitation events. That's exactly what we're talking about, and those have been increasing, especially in the eastern states, by you know, 40 to 50% more frequent now than they were just uh, a few decades ago. So get ready for more of those very heavy precipitation events. I know Florida has also been dealing with this onslaught of sargasso weed coming in off of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, part of the reason that scientists think that sargasso has been increasing so much is because of the warming ocean temperatures out there. Um, it's affecting the Caribbean and talk about an economic impact. If your beach is covered in the smelly uh, mounds of this of the seaweed, then, you know, that's <laughs> that's having a huge impact on the eastern shores of of, um, of Florida. And then there's, you know, the whole disease aspect as we warm um, Florida and elsewhere. There's a lot of tropical diseases that we expect to see uh, increase. In fact, I saw today there was a headline that malaria has been discovered or has uh, affected people for the first time in the United States. Um, so, you know, those are the kinds of things that are much harder to predict, but we've been expecting these kinds of things for a long time, but it's going to be really tough to pinpoint, okay, now it's going to be this and here it's going to be that. But, you know, this is the kind of thing that people have to uh, expect to see more of. Yeah, Florida is under a statewide mosquito-borne illness advisory right now. There are four cases of malaria that were identified in Sarasota County, but mm -hmm. not from travel. It was from spread right. by mosquitoes. And mosquitoes and other insects are going to be, uh, you know, expected under warmer conditions, expected to be 
more prevalent in a warming client climate. I, I also would like to know, we talked about sea level rise, but what about, what does that have to do with saltwater intrusion into our freshwater drinking water supplies? <laughs> well, that's something that they're going to have to really deal with in South Florida, especially, but yes, that is a problem. Um, what happens when saltwater starts to intrude on your drinking supply? And, uh, so that is something we're going to have to deal with. It's interesting. It's not just that, right? It's also septic tanks that they're worried about in South Florida. In fact, there are some people say some people that sort of scientists that say, and um, you know, experts on this particular matter that say that it may not be the water that gets some people in South Florida. You know, in terms of the, the actual rise of water, it may be the the septic tank problem. So um, there are a bunch of things that we're going to have to deal with now. You know, it's it gets complicated. What's happening in Miami Beach? They've done a good job in Miami Beach. I used to live on South Beach, and you know, during the time when when South Beach was flooding all the time, it's it's not flooding quite as much anymore because they've raised these streets by a couple of feet, uh, about two feet, I think. Um, I was there when they were doing the construction. I was living on South Beach actually, and installing pumps. They they put about six hundred million dollars into South Beach to raise the roads and install pumps. And that has helped the situation uh, on the roads, at least. Uh, but the water comes up from down below. It doesn't actually come up over seawalls. So it's coming up through the very porous calcium carbonate limestone. The ground is like Swiss cheese down there. Not quite the same around here. Uh, so we don't have to worry about that as much here in West Central Florida. But yeah, there are a lot of things that we're going to encounter. And I got to tell you, some of them we are not going to be able to engineer our way out of. And there was a hashtag um, on Twitter on the summer solstice. It was called hashtag show your stripes. And that had to do with looking at the history of heat and heat deviations from normal heat. What do these show your stripes bars look like last week when, when people were showing them? And especially, I would ask Jeff what they look like in Florida. <laughs> well, they look pretty similar almost everywhere, but, it, but local areas are, have a lot more natural variability. But basically from the mid 1800s until until now what you see is a is a very natural gradation from I shouldn't say natural but it's a gradation that goes from blue uh and then actually pretty quickly especially starting around 1980 it just turns red and it turns really dark red towards the end basically shows below normal uh global temperatures or local temperatures depending upon which stripes you're showing around the globe um it shows below normal temperatures in blue and then above normal temperatures in red. Now, this, I should say, was was created by Professor Ed Hawkins. And Jennifer may know this, but I started the first uh, Show Your Stripes campaign about five years ago with Ed and Bernadette woods Plackey from uh, Climate Central. Um, and we started it as Met Unite. So it was basically uh, a campaign for meteorologists all over the globe to show their stripes on television. And then the next year, it became this, it became Show Your Stripes, and it became a, a much more kind of, you know, widely, um, I, I'm not going to say celebrated, but <laughs> but a, a much more widely used uh, campaign. And, uh, and it's become very successful. And I have to give Ed credit for um, producing a, 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 what is a very simple, but very effective climate visual, which has truly become uh, you know, uh, the symbol of, of climate change around the world. Iconic. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm very sorry to say we're out of time. I have so many oh. more questions. We'll have to have you back again, but I want to thank both of my guests for coming on Tuesday Cafe, Jennifer and Jeff. Thanks for You're having welcome. me. I really appreciate you coming on. Jennifer Francis is a senior scientist at Woodwell Climate Research Center in Massachusetts, and Jeff Berardelli is chief meteorologist and climate specialist at WFLA-TV. We've been talking about climate change and current temperature extremes. If you missed any of this interview, you can watch it again beginning this afternoon. It's on, it'll be on our website, WMNF.org. Tuesday Cafe also airs on the television station TBAE on Tuesdays at 8 in the morning and at 2 in the afternoon. I want to thank our phone screener, John Dunn. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, News and Public Affairs Director at WMNF Tampa. During this time slot tomorrow, Shelly Reback will host Midpoint. Coming up next is Wavemakers with Janet and Tom Sherberger. Their guests will be Wendy Lee and Robin O'Dell of the Florida Museum of Photographic Arts. 
This has been Tuesday Cafe coming to you live on June 27th, 2023 from the studios of WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, and Lakeland. You can support programming like this by donating at WMNF.org. Thanks so much for your support of Community Radio.